Football on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Boyle Sports. Now with same-day withdrawals to your Visa debit card. You're very welcome along to the Friday Football Betting Show streamed across all of our social media sites here on Off The Ball. We're on YouTube, on Twitter and on Facebook at the moment. Today we're joined by Phil Egan from OffTheBall.com and Leon Blanche from Boyle Sports. Good afternoon to you gentlemen. Hey Will. Hey Will. Uh, we've got lots to talk about. We're going to be talking about the international football from the weekend just gone by and looking ahead to the return of the Premier League this weekend, including that meeting of Liverpool and Spurs, a crucial uh, battle in the top four. Spurs trying to stay in the Champions League spots and Liverpool trying to stay on the coattails of Man City as well. Uh, remember, if you have any issues with gambling, you can check out dunlouis.net for more information. Now, Ireland, lads, we are talking about the internationals last weekend. A mixed week, all in all. Uh, didn't play all that well in Gibraltar, got the three points. And then, pretty good performance in Georgia, Leon. Yeah, look, I mean, I thought um, it was great to see the players actually have a go. Um, work as a unit. They definitely had worked on it in training. You could see the difference with McCarthy having had a couple of days with these players. They were well drilled. Each individual knew their role. They knew when McGoldrick went, we've got to support him. There's no point in him doing it all by himself. And I just felt the way we try to get the ball down and play a bit of football. I know it was only 1-0. I think with a better striker, we could have won 3 or 4-0. Um, I'm not saying he didn't have an exceptional game because he tries his heart out, but just a striker with a bit more class. And that's no disrespect to McGoldrick because um, he really shone through on Tuesday night. But I think it's just, it gives everyone a lift. It gives everyone something to look forward to in June. We travel to play Denmark and then of course we have Gibraltar at home. 10 points out of 12, I take that right now. It'd be a very, very solid start. So yeah, you were covering the game. What was your take yeah, on it? I have to say, I came away from the Aviva and it was the most enjoyable game I've covered at the Aviva since 2015. Obviously, you had the Germany win followed by the playoff win against Bosnia. Mm. Now, we've had some dour games where like, you just look at the team, you don't really know what they're doing. So what was encouraging was straight away, you knew, you could even just looking down on the pitch, you knew how everyone was set up. There was more of an effort to play football in the right areas and we created chances. Didn't get as many shots on target as we should have. I know Heron's free kick, he actually had a great chance before that where he, he actually should have squared the ball to Robbie Brady. He probably fancied himself and the keeper makes a good save. But it was just so much more positive. Glenn Whelan, you know, we thought we'd seen the last of him in November comes in. I thought he was, he was excellent the other night because he's playing... He's protecting the back four, but when he gets the ball then, he had options. He had Howard and he had Hendrick, he had a ball out to Brady, he had Seamus Coleman available. He came through the mix zone after, you could tell he was absolutely buzzing and he, he knows, his exact words were, I know my role. Mm. You know, I wasn't picked for the Gibraltar game, but I was brought in for the Georgia game. And, okay, the second half was a little bit reverted back to what we've seen where we sat back a bit. I think with about 20 minutes to go, you yeah. can see the defensive line just Also as well, backward. I thought like there was lads blowing hard out there because we did play with a lot more energy. Like Martin O'Neill used to always talk about starting on the front foot, but it never happened. But yeah. it actually happened the other night where we started on the front foot and we kept it going and there was a great atmosphere. Even with the tennis balls, as soon as the tennis balls were off the pitch, before Harrahan struck the free kick, there was an almighty roar to kind of say, you know, we've made our point, now let's go and win the game, and then Harrahan scores the goal. You could almost say the fans assisted the goal. And the best clearing job was done by Glenn Whelan as well. Yeah. That he caught just in one movement as he was going for the celebration and yeah. put it into about the four <laughs> <laughs> Two cricket clubs looking at him, I say, when he retires. And I think a lot of them, I think a lot of credit has to be given to Darren Randolph too. Two huge saves, one against Gibraltar, one against Georgia. He's really playing out of his skin. Yeah, he's the championship team of the season. Yeah, I mean, I think he should be. He, to me, he's a Premier League goalkeeper all day long, every day. Um, he's been exceptional. But as Phil said, it just gives you a little bit of confidence that the way they played, they were on the front foot. I expected them to get a bit tired come the 65-minute mark because they put so much into that first hour. That's why it's key in international level, especially if you get a couple of chances more often than not, you will need more than one goal. Thankfully, we didn't need it on Tuesday night, but it gives us something to go to Denmark and not just sit back. Mm. Actually, be confident to have a go at Denmark. And let's be, let's be pretty clear here. Denmark have got one world-class player, in my opinion, Ericsson. The rest of them, they're okay. Like, we're not a million miles behind Denmark. 
So we should go into that game full of confidence. We're six to five now to finish in the top two. We're nine to two to win the group. And uh, we are sitting top at the moment. The draw between Switzerland and Denmark could actually it's really helpful, help yeah. us. Um, but look, it just, everyone is more positive about Ireland and that's a good thing. Phil, I was watching OTBM this morning, outrageous debate taking place uh, between Nathan Murphy and Adrian Barry, who's very entrenched in his position that Coleman played terribly. I thought Coleman was excellent. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a right back, and obviously the big call before the game was Matt Doherty was left out, and Mick McCarthy is in that unfortunate situation where two of his best players are right backs, but the difference is one is a right back, one is a right wing back. Seamus Coleman is a right back, now he could play as a right wing back, but he's also the captain and he's the leader of the team. You, you only have to think back to the night that unfortunately he broke his leg against Wales. The, the reaction from the players that night, I think it was uh, Shane Long said after that game, of all the players that happened to, not Seamus, like, because they just adore him. But he's, he's the captain, I thought he was, he was excellent. Matt Doherty, we, I'm sure he could play as a, a right back in an orthodox back four, but if you're going to pick Coleman or Doherty in a flat back four, you're going to go with the guy that has played there for all of his career. Whereas Matt Doherty is playing as a wing back now. Okay, he's had an excellent season. I can see why you don't play the two of them. I thought what worked well was Robbie Brady can come inside and that creates space for Seamus Coleman, whereas if it's Doherty and Coleman on the right wing, they're going to be making the same runs. Now, I think ahead to June, Callum O'Dowd could be in that position um, because Robbie Brady looked like he hasn't played much. Um, again, when we get to June, Mick McCarthy will have more time on the training ground. Hopefully some of the players will have more game time. Confidence is up. So that's why it was just crucial we got the wins. It doesn't really matter about what the scoreline was. Look, we take one nils all for the rest of the group, wouldn't we? And ultimately, Leon, they, this is the first time they got to play a game together was the Gibraltar match. There was no friendlies leading into this. Yep. You know, Obviously, things were a bit disjointed, understandably, conditions at the weekend as well. And then for the Georgia game, they didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare for this. So McCarthy's not had a lot of time with these players. No, he hasn't. And um, I touch on Phil's point, I think come, <clears throat> I think our first game back is the 7th of June. I think he'll have a lot more time with them to drill them and the one thing about Mick McCarthy's sides even when you look at them they all know their role under the previous regime players hadn't got a clue what was going on and that was clear for anyone who's ever watched a game of football players just didn't know where to be but definitely Tuesday night you knew that players were drilled when we're here go there and they did it and I like Odouda but I'm still I'd love to see Seamus on the right side of a three mm. because I'd love to see the way we're playing now, um, the, the left fall had a great game. Uh, Enda, Enda, Stevens. Enda Stevens. Good, yeah. I'd like to see Enda and um, Matt Doherty being our wing backs. And I think what it does is it gives you that ability to put three still in the middle of the park, but you've now got two up front. And you can revert that depending on who you're playing. You can give yourself more cover. But look, McCarthy at the moment is going 4 4 2. For me, I would love to see both Coleman and Doherty in our first 11. The reason being, they're playing with two of the top Premier League clubs out of the Irish squad. Mm. And, I, and I honestly feel when you've got players playing at a better standard, at a better club, they should be in the Irish first 11. But at the moment, job done, six out of six, let's roll on to June. Just to pick up that point, Phil, what do you think about the then, maybe say, Kyo Duffy, Coleman, Stevens and Doherty on the wides, three players in the middle, maybe Whelan and two in front of him and then maybe McGoldrick off a striker. Yeah, um, like I, I know a lot of people would think McGoldrick as a, as a 10, but I think the other night he showed he can lead the line and going back to the the system, it just sounds like Mick McCarthy wants to stick with a four. Uh, he, you know, he's been asked about this since he got the job and, uh, you know, it's been quite clear that he, he wants to play a four. Look, he might have a think about things, like he's got plenty of time now to look back at the the games against Gibraltar and Georgia before the, the Denmark game. Obviously, he's going to have plenty of time to train before that game in Copenhagen. But I don't know if you should go changing your whole formation just to fit Matt Doherty in. Like, I can understand people want to see him in. Like He's been one of the best players on the right-hand side in the Premier League this season. My only worry is that when he comes into the Ireland team, he's not playing with the same calibre of player. Mm. So... It's a huge risk to change your whole formation for a guy that we don't know 
what he's going to be like. That's why Mick McCarthy went for Coleman the other night. He's like, he's tried and trusted. Mm. Just to finish off, because we had a graphic there a moment ago saying, I think excellent was the word used about Coleman's performance. It was an OTB tweet uh, that we had up to describe Coleman's performance. Leon, what would you have used for the blank word in the sentence? Um, I would have said very good. Um, I thought Seamus done an excellent job. And I think when you look at what he gives to the Irish side, it's not just his performance. He's a real leader. And it would be very harsh on a guy um, who's had to fight back from injury, um, I thought he was exceptional in the Merseyside derby when you saw who he came up against on that occasion and he didn't look out of place whatsoever. So I think Seamus Coleman, when he's fit, he'll always be Ireland right back. And I think rightly so. And it's up to Matt Doherty. Maybe, um, as Phil said, you don't fit him in just to change the formation, but maybe Doherty has to adapt his game to try and get into the first 11. But look, it's great to have both of them. Um, there will be injuries, there will be suspensions, and it's onwards and upwards. I have a sneaky feeling Adrian Barry is going to die on that hill and probably die alone. There's <laughs> uh, very few people agreeing with him at this stage. Let's have a look then at last week's bets before we look forward to the Premier League this week. Uh, so, first of all, I think it's my bet from last week, which came in, thankfully, uh, which was England to score in both halves. Uh, they scored five goals last Friday night. And Portugal, again, Ukraine game to be less than uh, three goals. And as it worked out, Portugal weren't able to score in any of the games this week. Really. They won all draw and a nil-nil. They're struggling for goals again. So yeah. One. Yeah, they are. And then I think their main man came off injured, didn't he, in the second game. So they don't have a lot of goals in them, Portugal. They won a lot of games. They won a the Euros by winning one nils. Yeah. You know? So, but um, it's a slow start for Portugal. Only two points. Yeah, they're one of those teams where they just, they, when it matters, they probably get their their act together. But um, I just the, the visions of Will cheering England goals just so his bet will come through. Yeah, I'm delighted for Stephen <laughs> Doyle, by the way, <laughs> uh, because he is banging the Luxembourg drum oh, yeah. continually. And Luxembourg were part of his treble there. France uh, to win both halves, England to win, and then Luxembourg to win. That came in at 3-1. to one. So Luxembourg won from behind as well. So yeah. I think we listened to him on yeah, this. Yeah, no, um, I followed him. I backed him. Um, so I was delighted that they came from behind and won. But fair play to Steve. He has been going on about yeah. Luxembourg for quite some time. I don't know about their under-21s, so though. They weren't too impressive in Tala the other night. No. Yeah, true. Now look, our under-21s were impressive in and of itself. Now, Leon's bet was let down by those Portugal draws because you had Portugal to win, um, four teams you were going to win here, yeah. and they're the ones that let you down, ultimately. They were the ones that let me down, yet the Portuguese, we won't be putting them in for a while, Phil. No. You stay. But I said, they will they'll get their act together. Mm. Let's put Kevin Kilban into the Hall of Shame again. <laughs> uh, he was very ambitious with this, 22-1 to 1 from the start. Uh, he wanted Luxembourg to win, uh, which they duly did, uh, he was going for a draw between Liechtenstein and Greece, and uh, he was hoping that Sweden would win as well. Uh, Kev was always going for a rank outsider here, 22-1. Yeah. He's trying to build up, you know the way when he's been going on it for about 16 or 17 weeks and he hasn't hit the dartboard? He's hoping that a 20-1 shot will get him back level, but unfortunately it just didn't happen. We'll see if he's enough weeks left in the season to try and get back level <laughs> at some point. Now, Liverpool against Spurs is the big game this weekend, and Leon, that's where our first Boyle Sports offer is coming up this week. Yeah, look, it is the main event. Um, I think everyone is looking forward to Liverpool to win and Mane to score 13-8 to eight to 15-8. to eight. Mane just is not doing it for his club. Um, he did it for his country in the international break. And he's been the man that has probably kept Liverpool ticking along when they haven't been at their best. Um, it was a penalty against Fulham. Yes, his dive after that was a bit theatrical. But his goals have really kept Liverpool in the Premier League title race and um, Mane has been key. And I think the words that Klopp is using about him, he doesn't really know how good he is. And I think that's, that's a huge compliment to a player that possesses a lot, does miss the odd chance, it has to be said. He's not prolific as in his, like he's not a one and one or a one out of two. I'd say he's probably one out of three chances when he scores, but he's definitely kept Liverpool going. So a decent enhancement. Bill, what's your read on this? Firmino scored a couple of times during the week. For yeah, Brazil, like Mane is, like Salah was the main man. He was that man, as you, you hear so often <laughs> last season. But Mane is the main man now. And he can frustrate you sometimes. You think of the back heel he scored against Watford. The reason he had the back heel it was because his first touch position, was so yeah. bad. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. that's what he can do. He can go from being really ordinary looking to unbelievable. Like even his debut, his Premier League debut for Liverpool, he scores that unbelievable Arsenal. goal against Arsenal. Yeah. But the goal against Bayern Munich, was that's one of the best goals you see in the Champions League. Whatever about the touch, because there was great footage actually that we hadn't seen until last week of, it was behind, so you see Van Dijk pinging the ball at him 
and you see the the movement on the ball, the touch. But when he takes it down, Van Dijk has his hand in the air, like almost celebrating. But there was still so much to do, it, and he did it. And he actually would be the man you'd be thinking if anyone's going to score against Spurs, it's going to be him. I know Salah last season scored that wonder goal, which it looked like it was going to win it for Liverpool yeah. before Harry Kane got one of two penalties in that game. So it's it's such a massive game. Um, the last time they played this season, it was the half-12 game after an international break, and it was dull, it was tepid. Liverpool got the win. This will be spicier because it's a half-four game on a Sunday afternoon. We think it was exactly the same last year, and it was a really tasty fixture, late yeah. penalties, yeah. loads of drama. Are we expecting something like that again this week, Leon? Look, I think so. I think you've, you've got to look at Liverpool's home record. I think it's 36 games unbeaten at home. Um, Anfield has definitely become a fortress um, and I think having those couple of extra days will be a big plus for both teams it just gives their respective managers more time with them on the training ground but I think Salah hasn't scored now in his last seven games if you ever want to kind of end that goal drought Sunday is the perfect time and I think with Salah he's almost trying too hard that he's, he's, you know, he's taking that extra touch or he's trying to beat that extra man. I go back to the Merseyside derby, the couple of chances, especially the second chance, he would have never have taken that first touch. It would have just been first touch, a shot, have a go. But I think, I think, I fancy Liverpool. Um, I just think with Spurs at the minute, there's just something missing. Um, don't know what it is. Harry Kane, you can't leave him out of your side. Deli Ali's coming back in. Son, Ericsson, they've got a phenomenal squad, but they're just lacking that kind of, it's the killer instinct. You know, they were, they were hanging on to the coattails of Liverpool and City, but then they lost a couple of terrible games. And the European thing has kind of flattered them a little bit. They beat Dortmund, they played very well in the second half at home, and they went and got an away win. But their league form is questionable. And now you would say, with the draw in Europe, having been paired against Man City, it looks as if they're going to exit the Champions League at the quarter-final stage. And so it's going to be another year without a trophy. And you just, you got to question how long, he's done a great job, Pochettino. He hasn't spent a penny all year because he didn't bring anyone in. But I just wonder, Phil, how long does it take before you've got to start <laughs> saying, we need to win something? Yeah, I, I think where Spurs might fall down on Sunday is they're going to, they, they'll play a high line. And that'll suit Liverpool. And they've like I don't know what has happened, to Kieran Trippier. Like he yeah. had an unbelievable World Cup, and it's like he used all his chips there, and he's just had a shocker. Uh, Eric Dyer looks like he's going to miss out. So y midfield, like I remember when Yama came on last season in that fixture and scored an absolute screamer. Mm -hmm. So they, they they always possess a goal threat. Um, so if Liverpool like happened last season if Liverpool can't put them away this is a dangerous game because the draw for Liverpool is no good well we're assuming Man City win at Fulham tomorrow night, so. that's like the handiest Gimme. game that is the like if yeah. like Pep Guardiola is probably not too happy that he used to play at half 12 on a Saturday after an international break but if they said Pep you're playing Fulham he'd be like okay we'll take yeah, that yeah. Um, so the pressure would be up beyond Liverpool I think this is their toughest game left and Tottenham are key for this title race because they still have to play City. It's uh, sandwiched in between those European t uh, games against Man City. For some reason, though, I have this sneaky feeling that Spurs, I'm not saying they're going to beat City in the Champions League, but I don't think it's... When the draw was made, I thought Liverpool got the nicest draw with Porto. I actually thought United got the toughest with Barca. And a lot of people said to me, do you not think Spurs got the worst draw? I think Spurs, the new stadium is there. We've seen the videos. We've seen, like, the that's going to give them a huge lift and City are so... But you argue City are in the middle of a title race so therefore yeah, they've got to divide their attention a bit here as well. Also as well, Will, they're used to playing teams now who have just decided we can't beat them so let's just sit back. Yeah. So when you do actually have a go at City they might be a little bit undercooked and underprepared for what's to come. We saw this, this used to happen with Guardiola at Munich all the time where they had the league pretty much wrapped up. They don't have the league wrapped up now. Um, something has to give they can't challenge, I just can't see them winning that quadruple. So something's got to give, I don't know where it's going to, the crack is going to appear. Well April's going to be a mean month for them, yeah. because they've got Spurs twice in the Champions League, they've Spurs in the league, they've got their FA Cup semi-final, everything could either Manchester go perfectly, Derby. And Manchester Derby, Manchester could either unravel or go perfectly for the month. Yeah. yeah, 
And I think with Liverpool, I would just counter what Phil said a little bit in that Liverpool will be behind going into the game. And I think that almost makes it a bit easier for them. They've got to win. Mm. So, you know, if, if, if they were sitting on top by maybe a point and, you know, as we saw with the United games and the Everton game, Klopp was a little bit tentative. Yeah. He wasn't all out just to win, win, win. I think going into Sunday, they'll attack. And I think it'll be a very open game. I think both teams will actually score, but I think Liverpool will win. They're 8-13 to 13 to do so. Um, they have been back from 4-6. to six. Spurs have gone out from 4-1. to one. They're now out to 9-2. to two. But a draw is no good. Pretty much for either team. Maybe Spurs would take a point away at Anfield. It wouldn't Spurs be a bad result. Spurs record at Anfield. Yeah. Like they would take anything they can get. But I think it'd be interesting to see is Joe Gomez thrown back in. He's obviously back. Um, I think Matip has done a, a very good job since... Gomez has been out. Obviously, Lovren isn't in the picture at the moment. Alexander Arnold is a slight doubt. So, if Gomez did come back, would Gomez maybe go out to right back? It's a big call. Yeah, I've been out for what nearly two I, months. Like, but Alexander Arnold, he's got so much potential. But I don't know if he's the long-term solution for Liverpool at right back. I think he could end up being part of a midfield. I just, I think that's time, where they see him too. Yeah, Phil. I think they see him as a as a middle of the park all round midfielder yeah. a bit the way Gerrard I'm not saying I'm not trying to compare the kid but Gerrard started right full with Liverpool and then he moved into the middle of the park mm. so I think they have ambitions for yeah. Trent to be that kind of middle of the park guy you because know? he's very much it's all about going forward and every so often he can just just switch off for a slight second and you know he can get caught out so he, that would be a bit of a concern and you know that's why Klopp didn't start him at Old Trafford, yeah. because he felt, you know, like going into that game, there's too much at stake here. I don't know if he's if he's going to be ready for this because he, he had a shocker at Old Trafford the se- or the season before. He didn't have the best game. Yeah. But before we look at our own bets for this weekend, there's another enhanced treble here as well, Leon. Man City, Manchester United. That City away to Fulham. Uh, United's game against Watford, which is at home at 3 o'clock tomorrow, and uh, West Ham to win their game against Everton at home as well. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, like I think the two Manchester clubs should oblige, and then it's up to West Ham against Everton. West Ham are, they're very hard to work out, to be fair. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Declan Rice. A little bit surprised with Pellegrini's comments that everyone has a price already, so he's almost saying, come and bid for him, yeah. and if you bid enough, he's gone. Um, but Rice was very good for England, to be fair. He just dominated and controlled the tempo of the game. Poor opposition. But I think West Ham, at home, they have been good this year. So they're 6-4 to to win the game straight. So 3-1 to one to 5-1. to one. An extra couple of points, pretty much when you're banking on West Ham to win, it's a decent enhancement. What's well, thinking about West Ham, Phil? Because this is one I was going to throw into mind. Kind of thought about it. You don't West know. Ham at home are good. Yeah, they are decent. They'd be one of like for all the the jokes and the kind of given out about the London Stadium. They actually have a decent enough record there. Um, Declan Rice, this is all seems like it's coming to it's like all going to plan now. Where you know he's changed the agent, agent the caps. He has the caps. Now there's talk of the move. Now, if he had declared for Ireland, I'm sure he still could have got a move. But, you know, the cynic in me thinks this is uh, this is all uh, part of the plan. He'll get his big move to one of the, the bigger clubs. West Ham will make an absolute fortune off him. And Declan Rice will... He's certainly not going to be a one-cap wonder for, for England oh. like some... Irish fans might have mentioned before but yeah I the Everton win against Chelsea was huge mm. but they don't have a great away record M- Marco Silva actually has in his time in the Premier League has always had decent home records he's been the same wherever he's gone so away from home it's a case of don't really know what to expect from West Ham don't trust Everton yeah so it is a risk Maybe a calculated risk. Yeah. Those who are going as, as uh, five to one maybe is an enhanced treble. Phil, your bet for this week then is based on the three o'clock game tomorrow between United and Watford, and you're guessing both teams are going to score, and United pick up all three points. Yeah, Solskjaer's got the job permanent. Lovely fixture from lost their last two, but we knew that this was coming that he was going to get appointed probably around the international break. Uh, Watford have an eye in the cup final or a semi final. Now there is midweek games as well, but. If you're playing for Watford tomorrow, you want to win a place in that cup team. So, and they have enough 
that they can score a goal. I just think United will win, but I, I could see Watford scoring. It kind of may be like a 2-1, 3-1 kind of result. Um, and obviously that that's why I picked that. Leon, you expecting United win there as well? I think they will win, but I agree with Phil. I think both teams uh, will score. Watford are very capable. They create an awful lot of chances. and They've got some very technically gifted footballers, especially I love De La Feo. I think he's an, an exceptional talent. And um, yeah, but Ollie's got the job. Um, hopefully the wheels don't come off now. Hmm. But um, I think United will win. I think both teams will score, yeah. Okay, my bet for this week then, <coughs> after 2-1, to one, feeling a bit miserly last week, I've tried to pull a Kevin Cloban here by going for a big one. It's 10-1. Uh, to one. Southampton and Brighton's game tomorrow, both teams to score. Uh, Paul Pogba to score any time for Manchester United against Watford. And I think Liverpool are going to win in a game with goals. So I reckon that's going to be more than two goals in the game in a Liverpool way. Well, I'd agree with you there. I mean, I think there will be goals at Anfield. Um, I think Liverpool will win. Pogba to score any time. Look, he takes, he takes penalties, or yeah. will he take penalties? Yeah, he misses Rashford. Rashford. Yeah, he yeah misses Rashford. and Rashford scored. So I don't know who'll take the penalties. Don't be worrying me here. We're going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. the score. Well, listen, you're going for a 10-to-1 treble, so best of luck. OK, and Leon, talk us through your uh, bet then. Yeah, I think I've kept it simple. I'm just going to go, I think it was a treble. Yeah, I think Palace, I know they're just up and down and you can never really bank on them, but I think Palace at home to Huddersfield should have enough. Arsenal at home to Newcastle on Monday Night Football. Arsenal's home record is exceptional. They've only lost one all season, the very first game against City and Man United to win. So put the three of them together, two to one my treble. Kevin Coban then has gone for goal fest really tomorrow. He's got Leicester to win with both teams to score. He maybe doesn't quite trust Everton or West Ham to get the job done, but he's gone for both teams to score in that one as well. And if you do back along with Kevin Coban, four to one. Yeah, Leicester at home to Bournemouth. Bournemouth, uh, pretty bad away from home. Pretty bad all year, really. Yeah, like they had their moments where they they were up around sixth and seventh place, and they just have an incredible home record actually against teams outside the top six. I don't think they've lost a game against a team outside the top six at the Vitality for oh, well over a year now. Mm. So that's where they pick up their points. Switching then to finish off from association football to Gaelic football, because we have the three of the four divisional finals this weekend. Division three is going to be the week after this, but Division two final tomorrow. Enda Call, who's producing the show at the moment, is sure Donegal are going to beat Meath. Donegal have been impressive along the way. Uh, how are you guys pricing up for tomorrow, Leon? Yeah, I think um, I think Donegal they'll probably see off Meath. But for, as a Leinster man, obviously I'm a Dublin man, but it's great to see Meath come back because mm. Leinster football needs a solid Meath team, and it's good to see them in a Division Two final. But Donegal probably their favourites, two to one on Meath are nine to four probably just go with Donegal to shade mid. I don't think there'll be much in it. I think it'll be a very, very close final, but I think it might just go to Donegal. Phil, any guesses on tomorrow's game? Yeah, I think Donegal will win, but these are strange games where you know you're already promoted. So there is a bit of pressure off. Um, you know, you can maybe try out a few things if you lose. It's not the end of the world. Like, it's nice to get the silverware. Mm. I think Mead would prefer that obviously the silverware would mean more to Mead than it would to Donegal yeah for me I guess it's all important to get back up after 13 years away yeah. from the top flight as well and maybe one that might have a bit more spice of the weekend Leon Kerry against Mayo Division 1 final yeah exact same pricing in a Kerry at 1-2 to two, Mayo are 9-4 to four, and the draw is at 8-1 to one. Um, I think this is huge for Mayo if they could win a league title ahead of the championship it would just give them a huge springboard. And I think for James Horan, um, it'd be a massive statement of intent for him having gone back to Mayo. But Kerry, they're a very, very capable side. They're a young team. They've got a lot of talent. Obviously, a new manager who has been in charge of the minor, so he's seen the players grow. He knows who he's dealing with. I'm really looking forward to kind of watching this. It'll be kind of flicking between Liverpool and Spurs and Kerry and Mayo, because this is a four o'clock throw-in on Sunday. But I'm going Two to go screens, Mayo. Leon. Two screens, Two screens. I'm going yeah. to go Mayo, Phil. Yeah. I think Mayo at nine to four. Yeah, I just have a feeling for them. Yeah, um, they went down to Kerry and beat them in order to get here. So I just, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go Mayo nine to four. If then Mayo, you've bought, into, you've bought into a Mayo family and married into a Mayo family. <laughs> yeah. so. I just think if Mayo win, my God, like the, the Mayo fans would be booking the week off after the All Ireland <laughs> final because they'd be thinking, like, the curse is dead. Yeah, like, in fairness, they've done so well to bounce back after the defeat of Dublin because they came up to Crow Park thinking they could have a right crack at the dubs and it was awful. Mm, yeah. And you kind of thought, right, <clears throat> now 
the campaign is going to fizzle out for them. So I wrote them off at that point. I thought yeah. it's yeah. Tyrone or Galway who are going to get to the final. Yeah, well, like there's nothing better than being written off mm. because then you have something to to look forward to and to prove people wrong. Uh, and Kerry, it's, it's such a young team now and so uh, so quick and pacey. It'd be just I'm looking forward to seeing what they bring to Crow Park. You know the the big pitch, the wide spaces, and it's great experience. Look, all these lads have played in Crow Park anyway, given how good the, the minor teams have been in the years. But I would still um, I'd still be leaning towards Kerry, but I think it's going to be a great game. Should be a great triple header on Sunday at Croke Park as well. Maggie, thanks for joining us on today's show, and thanks to Leon and to Phil for joining me. And the best of luck if you're having a bet over the weekend. Football on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Boyle Sports. Now with same-day withdrawals to your Visa debit card.